Did Jesus call us to fight the culture war, or is there more to Christianity than just its values? One man battles against the elements of Hurricane Milton and survives upon his sailboat, but is there more to the story? We talk about all this and more on this week's episode of Faith and Pop Culture. Hey, well, what's up, guys? Welcome to episode number 32 of the Faith and Pop Culture podcast. It is me, your host, Daniel, and I am joined at the desk, as I always am, by the Marcus Brutus to my Julius Caesar, Samuel David Camp. What is that? What is it? E a a, a, a brute? brute? Yes. Was that my backstabbing uh, son, of, son of a gun? <laughs> well, uh, as you'll notice by my attire, fall has finally fallen, fell here in uh, the great southeast of the United States, and... The first day where a jacket could almost be required. Oh, gee, jacket weather's the bad. I miss the memo. Although I do have a, a sweater, so I'm close enough. inching into it. Counts. Uh, I'm inching into it. Very, but, very excited. Uh, but we're also excited because uh, we got some. Uh, so we got some topics today. We got some stuff to get into. Uh, there's been a, there's a lot of stuff going on in, in culture and uh, kind of some biggies. At least like uh, the concepts, the the, com the wider com implications. Yeah, I think are. Um, ones that are important for Christians to to navigate. Uh, to we got some great examples of bigger conversations. Yeah, think, uh, things is... that are just perfect fodder for a faith and pop culture uh, podcast. So why don't we get right into it? Because there's um, and and the first kind of story conversation is going to need a little. Uh, we got to set the game pieces on the board. Yeah, set the stage before we can start kind of you know playing the game. Like there's, there's a little uh, there's... a little bit of background here. <laughs> And the background of that is a a recently released movie, um, not documentary. I don't know what kind of what what do you call these sort of Borat esque movies? Um, there's got to be like a term for that, maybe documentary, I guess. But uh, yeah. by kind of cultural conservative pundit Matt Walsh, which is the movie "Am I a Racist?" Uh, kind of his follow up. Uh, he made uh, waves for his uh, was it was it What Is a Woman? His first, yeah, uh, kind he, of documentary. His big. So sort of he's kind of moving into sort of you know that sphere of you know creating films. It's a movie that I didn't see. Um, not crazy about Matt Walsh, as we'll get into, but like I was interested. But we were just I was on vacation when this came out. Yeah, I didn't go back. Uh, I think it would have been a good one to review because I think it, you know, like I I think these kinds of movies are interesting, um, and I think it's it's pushing back on a lot of sort of. DEI stuff, which I'm all in favor of, uh, and is doing it in a, in sort of a clever way. Yeah, and it's definitely like this is a movie designed to be um, like a conversation starter. Yeah, and that has definitely uh, happened. Although we haven't seen uh, the movie, there are a lot of people out there that are having a conversation about this. And kind of the um, the the setting for the the conversation we want to have is um, some people that had thoughts about this movie. Uh, so there's an episode uh, 636 of the Holy Post podcast, which is like a kind of Christian uh, podcast uh, where kind of the main uh, host that people might recognize, Phil Visser, who is the creator of the Veggie Tales. And I believe he voices maybe like Bob. Well, I think he's one of the yeah. Um, but you know the the show that many of you have you kind of grew up as a Christian kid in like the nineties like oh definitely you know Veggie Tales you you still yeah. got those song the bunny song stuck in your head uh, all these years later and for this episode he was joined by uh, host uh, Mike Erie and also Sky uh, Jethana, uh, a former pastor and a um, a current pastor and they discussed this movie uh, the Am I Racist from the perspective of uh, Christians and they had some. Um, they took some issue with some like the tactics. Like uh, again, if you're not familiar with the movie, this is like Matt Walsh undercover. You know, he's in disguise yeah. and he's you know kind of tricking people into interviews that don't know that he's you know that he's like actually like lampooning them. They think he's genuine and um, you know kind of this goes undercover and kind of tries to expose like you know who are they when they're you know their guard is down. Right, right. And very much like makes the proponents he's going against like this the butt of the jokes and right. at least from what I can tell from the you know the trailers and, and some of the scenes that have released and kind of one of the one of the quotes that the the podcast the Holy Post podcast hosts uh, kind of got into was uh, where Matt Walsh had said um, the real dividing line is between those of us who are willing to do what it takes to win the culture war and those who are not. 
um, and the the pastors, the the hosts are on the that podcast, um, kind of unpacked it a bit with one of them saying, you know, kind of the the big statement saying you cannot follow the Sermon on the Mount and engage in the culture war. Um, one of the other co-hosts chimes in and says, it's not, it's not just about lying and not just about the movie, obviously. This is an ethic that animates so much of the Christian subculture right now. If everything is on the line, then it justifies abandoning the way of Jesus in order to do what's necessary uh, to save yourself and those you love. And then kind of the kicker at the end where they say, if you have to set aside the commands of Jesus in order to fulfill what you think is Jesus's agenda, then we can be sure that you are no longer, it, that is no longer Jesus that you're following. Uh, so pretty strong, um, you know, words about this film, which yeah. didn't necessarily, um, if you know, <laughs> Uh, maybe the personality of Matt Walsh uh, didn't, um, you know. He had feelings about that. He had he had feelings, and he expressed those feelings in a video uh, titled "Veggie Tales Creators Has a Huge Problem with My Film." Here's a response, and we'll we'll link the 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 videos and the stuff into the uh, the show notes if you want to go watch like the full uh, context. Uh, but just to pull a couple of sort of his main statements, and then we can kind of get into uh, you know adjudicate this uh, you know as a third wheel to the the conversation. Yeah. Uh, where he um, so Matt Walsh says. I'm not discussing their work, uh, referring to the, the stuff by the Holy Post podcast host. Nobody is. That's because they haven't done anything remotely worth discussing in their entire lives. They haven't done anything at all. Vischer did Veggie Tales 30 years ago. That's something at least. These other guys, though, haven't done anything ever to move or impact the culture in any way. They don't do anything. They don't create anything. Instead, they spend their time dismissively critiquing the only people actually doing an creating things. And then he accuses them, says, you are not even qualified to hold the positions that you currently hold. You should not be in a self-appointed position of Christian leadership or a supposed Christian thought leader or whatever if you actually don't know how to effectively spread the message of truth and fight back against evil in modern culture. And kind of the main thing of his uh, his response that I think we, we can get into in our podcast is where he, he takes issue with the, the quote about the Sermon on the Mount uh, and says, uh, kind of referring to what they said about, you know, you can't follow the Sermon on the Mount and engage in the culture war. He says, there's a lot there, all of it bad. It's confused morally and theological stew of nonsense. And it's coming from the sort of weak, ineffectual, uninspired, utterly useless, limp-wristed, spineless, little mealy-mouthed, empty vessels that have all but destroyed the Christian church in the West. If I had to sum up all the problems that the Western Christendom is having, I couldn't do it better than what that guy said. It perfectly summarized the, that ephemerate, castrated form of Christianity that has invaded the church like a parasite. It is a statement that misses the point so much that it is basically unintelligible. And then uh, he kind of concludes by saying, let me clear this up. You can't follow the Sermon on the Mount unless you engage in a culture war. Uh, he quotes from scriptures, do not put a light or do not light a candle and put it under a bush. Let your light shine before men. That is the culture war. And can, to uh, unpack that a little bit further, he says, culture today is ruled by an ideology, referring to the DEI stuff, that aggressive, aggressively militant against Christian values and Christian teachings. We want to stop that. We want to defeat that ideology and install Christian values in its place. The other option is to surrender. Uh, so you kind of have these two, like, I mean, like one of them's on the North Pole, the other one's with the penguins in Antarctica. Like, yeah. That's about as polarized of sort of opinions on what I think a lot of us have been, whether we're like, you know, how deep onto the battlefield of the culture <laughs> war we are. We've been around yeah. that conversation, like that that rhetoric. Of, we've heard the words culture war. Um, and here you sort of have like the two, I think, sort of within Christendom, like the two the two options like because even the, the holy post guys say that you know they agree with walsh in one thing and that is that that is the dividing line like yeah you know, those that will just sort of do whatever it takes to win the culture war or for their view like that no actually those that will you know appear more to the commands of jesus rather than um the culture war so what are some of your initial thoughts on this i think we both uh have we have a lot of thoughts i think a, a lot of thoughts but <laughs> you sort of you've eavesdropped you've watched in on this conversation yeah so, yeah so i did watch like the matt walsh's video sort of response and it he, he shows the clips of um uh, of uh phil and, and the other guys uh talking about this and i think one thing that's clear is is i, I just think they're coming at this from two very different places and both claiming to come from the same place in, in like a weird way like i it, it's like they think they're both on the same team, but I, I don't know that they are. 
and if that makes sense. So like what, what uh, Phil and the guys are talking about is really coming at the culture war idea from a Christian perspective. Like, so what, what would Christ do uh, in the midst of this? Like, how would he approach this? And for Matt, it seems like it's not so much about Christ and sort of the truth of Christ. It's really about sort of the values that are espoused by the Bible and Christianity. And so, it, so in, in, in this weird way, they're almost both right. Because like, if what Matt Walsh is saying is like, we're about trying to like install Christian values rather than the opposite of Christian values, well, then the way to do that is perhaps what he is doing, which is like fighting this culture war and the sort of dogma versus dogma. But if what you're trying to do is like spread the gospel of Christ, that's not, that's, that's actually the opposite of what you should be doing. And so it's just, it's interesting to see, I think how, I think Matt Walsh kind of just misses the entire point of their critique about yeah, in the video, like in many ways, his response sort of reflects or validates or whatever the critiques of him. Like he, right. he, he sort of embraces what they say and like leans into it. Like, you know, yeah, exactly. That's why, I mean, in a way they, they kind of do the same thing. And I think, I think to be clear, like I, I don't necessarily, again, I haven't seen Matt Walsh's movie, but like, I don't, you know, from what I've seen of it, don't necessarily have as strong of an issue as the Holy Post guys do as far as like that tactic and like, or, you know, I think there is value in in having those conversations and pushing back against ideologies. Yeah. Like it's pro like I would say it's probably a fun movie and it's probably funny. Um, if who knows, but I think I think it's worth having movies like that. Yeah, and there. I think it probably is effective for even like I've seen this on you know in the YouTube space, right? Different like kind of non Christian reviewers that like, have actually talked about. Like, I think it's done good. So like my my issue isn't that like I don't think this movie should be made or that I'm like. It's the thing about this statement that when I saw it, I was like, okay, I, this thing, I don't, it doesn't jive with me, is more just the conflation of like, that, you know, not that this thing that we're doing is bad, it's just that this thing that we're doing is not this. Like, it's not the yeah. Christian, this isn't the Christian mission. Like, maybe it, yeah. it's, it's an area where as Christians, we can be involved in sort of the culture, but I think it reflects, it sort of embodies a, like a, a Christian worldview that I just find... I mean, prevalent, but like just disaster, like distract, like a, yeah. a, a very dangerous mindset that where it does sort of in a circular way, it just sort of make everything all about culture. Like it's, I think like kind of sort of this cultural Christianity that you keep hearing and, you know, guys like Elon Musk are espousing it. Like it's like when you see everything through the lens of just sort of this culture war, then like it all becomes about the culture. Like that's yeah. what you're fighting over. You know, we can be sort of a cultural... Um, Christianity, like it, it, it can lead, I think, very easily to a Christianity without Christ. Like, you know, which like, I think is what you see. Like, I think when you see, um, these sort of conversations, it, it is very much like there's really no mention of of Christ. I think in like Walsh's response. Yeah, and in some ways, he actually the scripture he quotes that sort of does mention Christ, or at least you know, represent Christ, like. He reinterprets that because like, he talks about the, you know, the, the quote, you know, his like proof text for the culture wars, you know, the, you know, don't light a candle and like, hide it under a bush. And he's like, you know, shining that light is the culture war. Like that's sort of these values that we need to instill, which just isn't what the scripture is saying. Like, you know, yeah. is the light when Jesus talks about, you know, spread the light. Is that light mean like these sort of Christian values about gender roles and stuff? Or like is the light... Jesus, yeah. Like, spread me, like you know, have me in you, radiate that in the culture. Like, let me set you free, rather than just sort of this, like, the values and sort of Jesus's like agenda, what Jesus wanted to uh, accomplish. Which even like, because even that though, like, misses the mark. Like, sort of this idea that like, you know, we need to. This is what Jesus called us to do: is to, to fight the culture war. Because you just can't find that with Jesus. Like in, mm -hmm. like in many ways, like the reason he was killed by you know, sort of the Jewish authority and leaders is because he wouldn't fight the culture war. Like, right. They wanted this, you know, their Messiah to come and like, hey, let's kick the butts of these Romans and let's, let's you know, set up this powerful kingdom. And like, we will be, you know, sort of this religious, you know, nation and community. And like, Jesus is like, well, I'm actually going to go have like lunch and dinner with some sinners. And like, 
you know, go find some women at a well and talk to them and like, you know, wash some feet of some people. And they're like, yeah, that's, we'll pass on that. Yeah. Like, that's not, we, we want, we want you to fight our battles. And yeah. It's like, oh, you need I to wanna, be taking up a it's sword. Like, I want to go, you know, love people. Cause even, uh, and then, uh, you can chime in again, but like, I even take issue with like sort of him being dismissive of these pastors. Like, you know, they have not done anything at all, you know, like very hyperbolic language, yeah. you know, to, to move the culture. And it's just like, well, like these guys are pastors. Like, I don't know them. It's not like, you know, I, I'm assuming they're good, upstanding Christian pastor men. Um, but like, like, I'm assuming they've led people to Christ and baptized people, like things that yeah. I don't think Matt Walsh is baptizing people. Like sort of this idea that like, but in sort of that cultural Christianity worldview, like that's not what matters. Like it's not about leading people, you know, setting them free from their sin you know, leading them to Christ, baptizing them, getting them plugged into a church. It's about just the values, the sort of the, the stuff around Christ without Christ, Yeah. which I think was why he can dismiss them as like, you know, they obviously haven't done anything for sort of God's kingdom because all they've done is give people Jesus, like, but they haven't really made you know, these widespread cultural things to to push back against sort of unbiblical, you know, ideologies and stuff. Like, am I crazy for that? Or is that? No, I mean, I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. I mean, it it, it very much is... Um, you know, watching his response to sort of their critique, uh, it, it, I think it is just very validating of their critique, and and it's just it, to me, it's odd that that someone would just kind of go on the offensive and <laughs> name call these people for sort of being critical of the stuff he put out, you know, and it's it's just kind of this weird time i think that we're living in where like you know he could make this whole video and and not really address the issue or or completely miss the issue um but i think in it, from his perspective maybe he you know he really put them in their place and yet like you said like to to, to say that like they've not done anything um i don't know there's, there's just some really bold statements from from mr walsh yeah, and, and there's a level of arrogance too. Like, yeah, to, like almost this assumption, that like whether he they would you know embrace this at all. Like, but implicit at least that like that we we can like more accomplish you know, more effectively accomplish Jesus' agenda than Jesus could. Like, yeah, you know, if the, if the goal is just to spread these Christian values in the you know in the culture, well, Jesus didn't really do that. Like, Jesus wasn't interested in doing that. Like, Jesus didn't act in a way you know like you know I think Jesus' character was one of loving of sinners and grace and patience. Like he wasn't just angry ranting about the like sort of the things that you see in a lot of like the cultural Christianity. Yeah. And I feel like by especially by framing it so starkly of like, you know, like you guys are just, you know, you guys are the, basically the enemy. You're working was just how well ends the video. Like, right. You're working against like by framing it so starkly, it's almost like like Jesus's character would would be framed as the enemy in that context. Like, right. It's like, well like, you know, Jesus, he, he had some good principles, but he just wasn't willing to like fight the battle hard enough. Like, yeah. He just, he, you know, he is this sort of this, you know, soft, he was going to go die and not even like, you know, fight back against these, you know, Roman secular, you know, pagan ideologies. And, yeah. but we, in, you know, in 2024, like we can be mean enough and like we can sort of be manly enough to like actually step out and start fighting for these battles and you know, fighting for Jesus, you know, fight when Jesus can, you know, stand behind me, you know, I got my shield, we're going to go fight. And like, there's this like a like, like a disgusting arrogance to that of like yeah like if you like that Jesus didn't know how to accomplish his kingdom and we do because we're willing to like say mean things and fight back and like I don't know like that's if you just look at like hold that kind of those characters up like I think like what one is more representative of how Christ did it I mean that's pretty clear yeah I, I would I would definitely agree with that and I just think it and I think that's what's so um, I think can be so destructive about this this ideology and this conflation of sort of Christianity with some sort of uh, maybe just Christian values, like the 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 ethics and the values of Christianity. I think is is not a replacement for Christianity, and yet I think there are many people. Uh, maybe Matt Walsh included, who would say that it, it seems like, no, it is a replacement. And what we really need is the Christian values in our society. And what they see is the problem. Um, 
you know, the DEI stuff or woke, whatever, um, all these things, you know, we can agree that we don't like those things, but is the, is the response and is the solution to those things like, well, we're just going to like get more Christian values pumped into the system, you know, by, by whatever means necessary that's that's not going to solve the problem either and because i think you could look back and see like we had a bunch of christian values you could say you know for many years and where has that led us and you know it's like well we're in this place of like all the woke nonsense or whatever and so i don't know i just think i think he really just misses the whole point of i think what the phil and the other guys were saying yeah and i think there's also just like a selfish component too of like, i feel like the like the the hope of like winning the culture war i think if you boil it down in a simplistic sense maybe but like it's really about us like we want that we want to live in a country in a nation that has these values that we affirm. i guess yeah it's sort of like you know the, the world we don't like you know raising my kids in a you know as a, we're both parents like raising our kids in a world that is you know has these ideologies and like I get that. Like, I don't. Like, I don't want my... There's things I need to help my kids navigate. And I, I will be glad when some of these ideologies sort of do, you know, get put in their place. But like, but it's sort of all about us. I like guess there's yeah. very little in sort of the culture war rhetoric of like, you know, setting people free from their sin or like setting... Like, yeah. Helping other, you know, it's sort of like, well, if we can just sort of, you know, break their grasp on this sort of, you know, political ideology or something like that if we can de chair them from these you know academic halls yeah, it's like that's like, gonna some in some ambiguous way like you know set them free and i you know as though, like tearing that down is the same thing as like giving them jesus and not yeah. just leaving them empty like which is why i think like which is why i wanted to talk about this uh, conversation because to me i mean even like here with our with our collision like we, we we try and take like that's why we we don't sort of take a lot of like the culture war stuff like not that we don't like i have my opinions on a lot of the culture yeah stuff. Like, not that like, christians should be engaged in some of that like there should be and there's things that christians should push back like, you know the, the pro like all that kind of there's there's things for christians to very much you know racist things and there's things you know things christians should stand up and, and take action for yeah um, it's just that like i feel like we lose the plot when it becomes just about sort of, you know, yeah. what Jesus sort of wanted rather than Jesus. Like, I don't think Jesus is interested in us being like, well, here's sort of some some life lessons and some governing principles for a country. Like, here, you take that, you know, and, and then you go off and I'll sort of be over here in heaven doing, like, he wants us to have him. And I feel like some of the, the, the rhetoric of this just misses that completely. I yeah. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, I mean, I think that's the thing, because you can't really look at the scripture and, and draw those conclusions that that we need to be out there like battling for culture like because it just i think it misses the whole point of the gospel the whole point of of jesus um because it's just it's the exact opposite of the approach that jesus would take well and it's funny and then we can maybe end on this but like because like it is the exact opposite like the yeah. you know the hardest the harshest words the closest jesus ever came to like delivering like a matt walsh-esque speech was like towards the religious people that we're so obsessed with like the principles and the rules and the command like, so it, with sort of the culture of religion and yet missed him like didn't have a th there wasn't room in their sort of religious you know belief for like that you relate to him like yeah that's like the, the the most we ever see jesus sort of you know like start spitting fire a bit was against sort of that cultural like not christianity at the time but, like that cultural religion you know if we can just sort of keep this you know if we can just sort of police our country our nation to like just live by these codes right and we're then that's what matters and that's what's gonna you know that's what, that's what will make us pleasing to god and like jesus is like no like i have no place for that like i like i'm the only answer to that like it doesn't you can keep all those commands and this nation can be you know as as like traditionally like proper jewish as as possible and yet still completely miss out like on yeah. the kingdom that i'm well and i and i think it so clearly summarizes it when you know like jesus said i am the truth not i will direct you to the truth and i think that maybe sort of perfectly summarizes some of i think the issues that we're seeing now sort of in this cultural christianity christian values versus christianity or following jesus and it's it's you know 
when Jesus says, I am the truth, it's like the whole point of it is a relationship with Christ, not like, hey, I, I have the best path to these enlightened values over here. Like the values are a byproduct, I think, of following Christ. And I think when you when you just take the byproduct and sort of skip over the point, then this is what you're left with is just this just weird culture war of like and it's just, let's just empty yeah because there, it's a it's a war without substance because you've removed the thing that gives those principles and stuff substance but i think it is so attractive because it doesn't demand anything it's it it's it, well it's all and it, like like yeah. you said it's all about you and i think that's what it's like oh yeah well you know just give me my marching orders and i'll go and well, like, it puts you in the position of the one in power like you're right. like, i know how this culture should run i have the truth yeah so i'm gonna go march and be mean and you know push back and fight this war and put down the, you know, the ungodly enemies. Like that is a, that applies more to like our carnal sinful nature than like, I'm going to go submit as a sinner before God. And like, you know, I'm going to surrender my, you know, my own sort of agency and all that stuff and purely, you know, just surrender to God. That's a less, that's a way more demanding. And like, yeah. like that, that goes against our sinful nature, which is why I think, this sort of brand of Christianity, this sort of like culture war, you know, cultural Christianity, I think why it spreads so much is like, because it, it really, it gives you the good stuff that we want without any of the, like the sacrifice. Like it's, yeah. this isn't a pick up your cross Christianity. It's like a pick up your sword and go fight. And like, right. Woo, you know, we're going to win the culture war and it's going to be about us and we're going to be in charge. And as opposed to like, actually, I, I'm going to lay it all down at Jesus's feet. And like, I'm not in control. I got to just trust God on this. And I got, you know, if God calls me to speak or to act, I will. But like starting from that position of like surrender and like humility. And you just, I think that's what is completely missing in a lot of this conversation. But hey, if you guys have uh, strong thoughts on that or just have, if you've seen sort of that mindset, I mean, it's hard not to find that like that yeah. sort of culture of Christianity. Uh, but I, I think it, that is, uh, I think there is a dividing line there. And it is one that I do think like the podcast hosts, like you almost need to pick a side. Like you need to decide like, Am I just fighting a culture of war or like, am I submitting to Jesus? Like, yeah, because I think you can't really have either of those as the priority uh, at the same uh, time. Uh, but speaking of other weird things going on in culture, um, well, not just weird. We'll start with the more serious stuff. Uh, there's been some, uh, there's been some weather. Like, there's been a lot going on. Some very I intense mean, weather. Um, and like, you had the opportunity, uh, was it last week? Like, you went and did yeah. some disaster relief. I uh, got to use a chainsaw yeah. and whatever else you were. Well, sadly, I didn't get to use a chainsaw, but uh, which that was my hope. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was down sort of in uh, southeast Georgia doing some work down there in a place called Vidalia, which probably most people haven't heard of. And it doesn't really get any sort of press that I can see. But like two weeks later or two weeks after Hurricane Helene and like still there are people without power, there's like tons of power line poles just split in half um and just crews working around the clock down there so i just did a very very small like work down there for a day to just do what i could um and it's just it's crazy because it's only like uh two and a half hours or so from our house uh from where we live and yet it's like people still without power like it's just you know trees down just everywhere well i think um, it's it's just the nature and i think it's understandable like it's not i think we all do it but i like just how quickly we move on to like yeah you know this you know because like again we like school was shut down here and like we like my house lost power for a day and like you know we had very mild though like yeah yeah you know, like we were out walking you know like walking my dog like that evening like you know yeah like, but it's then it's you know you see some of the pictures and stuff going on in like Asheville and other places and it's like like people are still really suffering from this and, like, and it's, like and it's hard to keep that like and it, it, i think it's impossible unrealistic to like yeah just live like otherwise we just live in a constant state of just like heaviness of like yeah. there's always suffering going on and we just can't carry that all the time um, but i think one of the ways we kind of can escape from that is into the world of sort of social media so kind of one of the one of the interesting stories that i've sort of been tracking uh, based on like the the more recent hurricane that went through florida with uh, hurricane milton um, is the kind of the viral character story uh, that emerged from that um, from that tragedy which is uh, lieutenant dan which hey my name is dan i i I feel like that would be a good name, nickname. I can yeah. go by Lieutenant Dan. Uh, the real name, though, is uh, Joe Malinsky, who is uh, he's 54 years old. He's an amputee. And he just sort of became this, like, 
instant overnight viral sensation. Like, yeah. Uh, sort of this, it, it seemed like it promised sort of, you know, in the midst of suffering and tragedy, you know, here's this sort of inspirational, because if you, if you haven't followed sort of some of the stories and stuff, like he's this guy that has like a, a small like sailing boat. And I mean, like, he's not leaving. Like he's in like the path of the hurricane. Yeah. And like, he's going to ride that thing out. Like he's going to, you know, he's going to stay in his boat you know, make sure that night, that knot is tied uh, uh, yeah. pretty tight, and he's gonna kind of wait it out, and and he's and sort of his story. I forget exactly how he first emerged onto the scene, uh, like whether he was interviewed by a different uh, TikToker or how that worked, but quickly became sort of this like man versus nature, you know, almost like a Hollywood story waiting. To yeah, happen, of sort of this guy, and and just sort of you know, all this attention got brought on to him of like people interest. People wanted to know like you know, there's like people tracking his every you know hourly updates on how you know lieutenant dan is, is surviving uh through uh, the storm and some of the interviews too especially if you're a christian kind of i mean like it it was hitting the sweet spot like he was saying all the right things uh so some quotes that he said in some of these uh these videos said you know i put my faith in god i don't put my faith in man god told me to come out here and get a get a boat uh, i came out here and got a boat everything he's been telling me the last few days i'm doing the right thing he's got my back i'm in good shape I ain't sweating it. And then in a different interview, he said, when you're, a, when you're a warrior, a soldier, you do what you're told. And God told me to come here and get a boat. I came here and got a boat. I believe in a lot of the TikTok spiritual leaders that I listen to. And I hear messages that are sent from God that he's got his finger on the eye. He's got his finger on the eye of the storm. So I don't have to worry about it. Um, Amen. Yeah, that, that'll preach. Uh, you know, you can, you can shout that yeah. from the mountaintop. Um, and like, as tends to happen, like, you know, Everyone else sort of wants in on, on some of the spotlight, and like so, you know, a lot of other like TikTokers, social media stars, kind of like jumped in to you know, insert themselves in, into this, you know, into the story. Um, so like there was a, a different TikToker, um, T- Tampa Terrence, is the name he uses, started like a GoFundMe support. Uh, you know, it says GoFundMe to support L- L- Lieutenant Dan's seafaring dreams, which as of I checked yesterday had raised like forty six, you know, over forty six and a half thousand dollars of people donating their money to help this guy you know get a new boat or like you know support well, I, his yeah i would say saying they will donate their money to support lieutenant dan will that happen i, I just yeah well yeah i have i have skepticism uh, when like these good good natured folk on the internet say hey we're gonna raise money yeah. for this it's like well, yeah, that's how I, I, I hope that's where it goes, but <laughs> um, we'll see. Because then another, another TikToker, uh, Aiden Ross, offered on a live stream with uh, Lieutenant Dan like $100,000 to buy, you know, buy his new boat and like a streaming deal, which it seems like I've seen conflicting amounts, but like could be as high as like a million dollars, like this massive streaming thing. Um, like he's, he became like this hero, you know, the, the hero we all needed in the, in the face of, uh, of the, the storm. <laughs> yeah. What's interesting to me is like what happened after that? Like, because like, in many ways, that's the sort of this like feel good story. And yeah. we all want that. And, you know, we're all, there's people are suffering. So, you know, this is sort of this light. Um, but sort of like what's transpired since then, I think reveals a lot just about, so, you know, I kind of call it like our TikTok culture, but like sort of this social media reality TV esque yeah. culture that we, uh, that we live in. Because like as he, his fame rose, like people started to see, like, well, who is this guy? You know, beyond yeah. the man in a boat, uh, who is this? And it seems like this guy, uh, Lieutenant Dan, has he has a past because uh, he. I mean, you you might have even seen it if you if you're on social media, like you know, there's like collages of like all of his mug shots. Over he's done. Last. He's done some time. He he's uh, he's been behind bars. Uh, you know, as recently as um, you know, he spent like six months. I think earlier this year or the end of last year, like, like punching a police officer in the head and like you know fighting back against a police officer. He was ar- arrested uh, last year uh, for allegations that like he was trying to light a woman on fire. Like he. Was like dousing her with gasoline and like I think holding like a cigarette and he was like threatening to like uh, light her on fire. Like, it seems like he's not necessarily not the hero, not the hero <laughs> uh, that we were led to believe. Yeah, he's not sort of the squeaky clean hero against uh, the forces of nature. And kind of what really brought this home, and then we can get into it, uh, is like his daughter. I think yesterday, as of recording this podcast, um, released her own like TikTok video. I mean, like very emotional. Uh, and just sort of like speaking about the, the, I guess like the the unintended consequences of what so many people thought were this good thing to you know support yeah. this guy. And here, there's sort of a, a clip from um, from that she says, "You're all going to put him in the grave early for making him famous and giving him this money. You all don't even know what the bleep you're doing. 
Nobody actually cares for him. You're all just using him to make him famous, make yourself famous, but nobody bleeping cares. Um, which I mean, it's, it's a powerful thing coming from the his daughter. daughter. Yeah. Um, but what do you think about this? Because this is a like I feel like there's this is like a case study of like you know in two acts or whatever of I think some of the positive, but like a lot of the negative of sort of this social media reality TV bubble that we can live in. Yeah, I mean, I think it just reveals how like hungry people are to just be famous and be stars no matter what. Um, because I think you know, and we've talked, we've said this before, but I think. You know, you ask kids today, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And a lot of them will say, like, TikTok stars or, like, a YouTube influencer or whatever. Like, it's – that has become, like, such a uh, high watermark for so many people to chase after. Um, and so I think it's just, like, you see – I think uh, an instance like this, at first maybe you could think, okay, well, this is, like, hey, people just trying to support this crazy guy – on a boat in a hurricane like which is like that's crazy enough on its own and like i have issues with somebody who wants to do that but it it, it quickly just shows like they're not really in it for like this guy's well-being and it's like it's really just about views it's kind of you know what it cynically all comes down to is like views and clicks and and it's it's interesting because it's not just like you know, media companies doing this. There's like individuals now because of things like social media that you can go and find sort of the next viral thing and sort of attach your name to it and try and, you know, you know, what is it like clout chasing or whatever they call it, where you're just, you know, you're grifting essentially on whatever this thing that's going off uh, on social media to try and like, you know, elevate your own channel and status and success. Yeah, and I think it's also too like there's like an, an element of just like reducing things to a spectacle. Like yeah. Because like, I think in some ways uh, maybe it's a squiggly rather than a straight line, but like I think is related to like the first thing about the Matt Wall. Like it's this this sort of draw to almost like make this parallel world. Like this sort of you know we we live over there's a lot of bad stuff going on. Like we're gonna kind of make this like this you know parallel track this universe we can kind of live into. You know like like for, for the hurricane. Like, horrible tragedy like lives are lost like people's you know like tons and tons of damage yeah they're for a lot of people that were in the path of this like that's like they're gonna forever change their life or you know at least they're gonna be be struggling against that you know for a long time and like and that's difficult like that's that's uncomfortable that if we want to like help like you know like you going and helping like there's it, it demands more of us but like I think what what this show is this like our tendency like the the thing that keeps coming to mind for me is the Hunger Games like yeah in many ways our culture has like that movie has been proved like vindicated like valid like very prophetic of like you sort of have suffering you have these you know real world stuff and like our sort of escapist way to deal with that is just to turn it into like a, a game show like to turn it into yeah. just a spectacle that you know now we're just sort of we have found our hero even we don't care that he's not. You know that he's trying to light woman on fire like he's he sort of represents you know and we're, we're giving tons of money to this guy having a boat you know not the people that are, have lost their homes like you know there's right you know this guy sort of becomes this like fun like we almost we, i think a lot of our, the culture is like almost following it like a like it's the dallas cowboys like yeah you sort of want your update and he's your guy he's your champion and he's he's you know is he winning are we gonna hang in there and he you know you grab your popcorn and check for the next lieutenant dan update on the news and like it's just sort of become this way to like you know, to escape, block out the actual suffering and, and seriousness yeah. and just become this sort of empty, like, you know, very like cynical sort of escapist reality of just, you know, like, like a reality TV show of like we've turned respect. It's just a big spectacle. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, it's just it turns these really huge tragedies into just a spectacle and it, 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 it removes you from. Uh, the hurt and the devastation because it's like oh well it's just a it's a fun thing of lieutenant dan in the storm it's like no it's not it's not you know not millions of people losing power in their house flooding again after a second you know hurricane comes through like that's you know that's unfortunate but tell me more about lieutenant dan and his boat and his battle against the elements like and so it is and it's not wrong to like escape 
uh, from time to time. But it's it's really bizarre, and I do think it is very much like a Hunger Games type of thing in real life because it's like this this isn't just like a like this is a real hurricane and like real damage is being done and like somehow we're finding it fun to like follow this guy yeah it's become entertainment um, right which like you can't you can't imagine that in a world without like social media you know like the yeah. chicago fire or you know some of these tragedies like the plague people in you know the next city being like well but how is you know jeffrey smith hanging in there from his you know yeah like sort of, you know are are people are making bets you know like hey yeah, yeah you, they, people are literally placing bets on if he would survive or not like i mean it's like, Hunger games like it's yeah i mean that's sort of this like okay what's this use you know because like and i think like her video the the daughter's video nails it that like maybe not nobody but like the vast majority of people sort of engaging in this don't care about this guy no like no. you know they don't if he, if he did die they'd be sad and they'd move on the next like, the next right minute. like it's just he's just sort of this like vessel this vehicle for us to sort of get a sort of you know a cheap entertainment really divert us for a little bit on social yeah. media before we just go on with our life like, or the people trying to support him like a lot of them are just you know like hey this guy is the main character right now and i, I gotta at least be a sidekick and you know like, i i need to get on, on some of the attention like look how good i am i'm gonna support this guy and give my money yeah. and film myself doing it and i like, guess i think the more you think about it it's just like super dark <laughs> yeah like, like it, the the very much the dark side of of social media and like, and like you said i don't think there's anything wrong like with finding inspirational stories that uplift us in the midst of you know, like even like the first hurricane, I kind of there's some viral clips of like a news reporter that like stops his report to go like literally save someone's life that's drowning. Like, yeah, and like that was such like a oh like that's cool. Like that yeah. people, you know, sometimes we think people are just terrible these days, but like they're not. Like people can do good things. And, like, yeah, it's like it's not that it's wrong to to find those inspirational human drama. Like, yeah, and I think, and I think you, to yeah, I was gonna say you um, you almost need those, and they're everywhere. Like especially coming out of like. North, Western North Carolina, like there's just tons of stories of people who are just doing crazy things to save their neighbors. Yeah, like that's good. The danger is just sort of the 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 fine line of like where you cross over from just sort of like actively caring about people to sort of dehumanizing people to just sort of serve this like this entertainment spectacle for the day that we can sort of follow and make memes and like kind of do yeah. this thing. Uh, so I don't know that that just stood out to me because I feel like in so many ways that reflects. A lot of like the things that aren't healthy about sort of our you know social media uh, culture. Uh, but kind of the next thing is that there are some new movies. Uh, if you need some other things to divert you from some other spectacles uh, from everything yeah. going on in uh, either the culture war or the hurricanes or anything in between. Uh, the next segment we have out now and coming soon. So a couple of things that are out. I, I think last week I kind of talked. We don't need to get into it because but the piece by piece movie. Uh, yeah. Sort of like the. The, the Lego Pharrell Williams movie. Uh, I didn't actually see. I don't think it did. It didn't make a ton of money. Um, although, like, I, I assumed it would have this like big budget because it's like big Lego movie and animated. It's usually expensive, but apparently not. Apparently, it's not that. Mm. It's like sixteen million dollars to make the whole movie. Oh wow! Um, so I think this. I think it only made like three million. <laughs> like it's, it's, it might still lose money, but it's not a yeah. big um, failure. And I just I don't know. I haven't really heard. I've heard from a few people. I think hip hop fans will like it. But I, I'm not a hip hop fan, so yeah. I didn't like it. Uh, but the thing, I, the thing I did like, because I like fantasy, is uh, the Wing Feather Saga season two. Uh, so the show itself, um, by Out Now, I mean Out Now for a limited port, uh, segment of society. Uh, yeah. This is a show that is through Angel Studios, and the way that their sort of business model is like a, a staggered release kind of, of like. Like I think it's available if you're like an Angel Studios Guild member. Like a, you know, you're not just paying for their subscription, but like sort of a member in their thing. It's not available, I think, for just like the wider public. Although I think you can get like the DVD. Like, so I think you can still find ways to watch it. Uh, but I had the chance to see it for the first time. They were kind enough to send me the seasons. I, you know, I watch it with my kids, and it's good. Like I love this show. Like I don't. Uh, when you're when your kids are old enough, they get they gotta yeah. read these books. Uh, to me, it's the closest, um, not the same tier, but like the closest sort of. There's always that question of you know we had Tolkien, we had C.S. Lewis, like where are the fantasy writers that you know these days? Like you know, do we peak at that? And yeah, we peaked at <laughs> Tolkien and Lewis, but probably the closest we've come since then, I think, is the Wing Feather Saga. Like that's the mm. most that that captures some of that same sort of theologically mature kind of fun storytelling. And the show, I think, is doing. Um, is doing the the books 
justice. Uh, so if you haven't uh, heard about it, you're still curious, uh, do check out uh, the... I have the, the full review of season two uh, and season one on um, our YouTube channel. As far as coming out um, or coming soon, uh, kind of the, the two movies that are coming out, uh, which I think I might see both, might only see one of them. Uh, one of them is Smile Two. Are you familiar with like it, it, it's like a horror movie and like the about like a smile monster and people that like possess people make them smile. Like it to me, it looks just ridiculous. Like it, although it did well enough that there's Smile Two. The so second. people watch, and I think. Probably most people know it from they did some like very clever viral marketing where like they actually like hired a bunch of people and just like distribute like disperse them out into culture to just do this weird creepy smile from the show. So there's like baseball like watching like you know, baseball games and there's just like this weird person in the stands sitting like doing this weird smile and like you know it, very clever but like <laughs> made awesome. it sort of this this you know like brilliant but like made it sort yeah. of this thing like, oh what why are these weird people appearing at these sports events and like on you know live tv and different stuff just doing this uh, creepy smile uh, that's brilliant so, so i think that's cool i'm not sure yet uh, it's just going to depend on the, how this week goes if i'll check it out i haven't seen the first one and i don't know i think it looks dumb uh, so so i may not see that <laughs> Gotta one. see what all the fuss is about though, <laughs> but, daniel but i might so stay tuned for the sake of the people yeah for you for your sake i might uh, i need to know out. like what if like I'm, i might want to see this and how am i supposed to make my decision <laughs> Unless you've I just know, done like, a review. I never smile, so I'm obviously not possessed by this. Yeah, this is really... Yeah. So it doesn't apply to me. Yeah. Because uh, I just... But for other I, people. I frown all the time. Who may be uh, so inclined. But the other kind of movie, not a big movie, uh, but an interesting one is that's also coming out. It's called Exhibiting Forgiveness. And this is a movie... Um, I can't pull the, the guy's name. It's made... It's sort of like the, the directorial debut of like a, a, an American artist. Like So it's... It's like not a mainline guy making a movie. It's like an artist, like a visual artist, painter. And he's like making a movie and it's kind of semi-biographical, like his relationship, strained relationship with his father and like how he, how he dealt with that, uh, which I've actually, I've seen. Like they sent, I was sent this movie early. Um, I've had it for a while. Finally had the chance to check it out uh, just a couple of days ago. And I think it's really good. Like it's, it's an interesting movie that like there's, there's some pretty heavy profanity. It's very raw. Um, but it's also like a lot of spiritual, like, you know, like talking about Jesus and forget like it's, it's wrestling. It's almost like a faith based, but not like church face. Like it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's dealing with the same things that a lot of like church and in many ways it's dealing with the same stuff that like the forge movie was like, it's, it's both mm. sort of these, like, you know, these black kind of experience of like this young black man and a strained relationship with his father and like having to forgive his father for who he was. Like, very similar on like, the surface, but a very different approach to that conversation. Mm. Like this doesn't give you. Like, this is a tough movie to watch. Like it doesn't give you easy answers. It really just lets you sort of, uh, you know, just sit back and like look at sort of that relationships of like, hey, it's hard to forgive people, and like th even when you forgive them, there's still that hurts. And how do you like? So I think it's it's doing a lot of interesting things. I don't think anticipate this being like a big, you know box office kind of movie and it's not necessarily a feel-good movie yeah uh, but i think it is like a in some ways a profound movie uh, so i should have the actually it may already be up on our channel and our website uh, the review for that but for sure by the weekend i will have a review uh, for that but speaking of something else that i already have for all of you the good people that listen to this podcast and you sam oh, is the next segment of this podcast we have things we like that you should like too So let it be known that I actually had uh, a great heavy metal uh, Viking, fin Finland's best melodic death metal Viking band that I was going to talk about because they're doing a tour in Atlanta and I have tickets. But something else came out, so I uh, put a pin in that. Uh, and I thought I would just share um, a movie that I really like uh, that I just had the chance to revisit, and that is A Quiet Place. Um, you know, it's, it's Spawn. There's, you know, the, the third movie in the series came out earlier. Uh, this year, but actually had the, the chance, uh, you can see the first lecture on our, our YouTube channel to like partner with like a high school class and like zoom in and sort of give a guest lectures on it's like a faith or, you know, gospel and film class, um, you know, just to help Christians like talk about movies. And actually, like, as of recording this, I did, I was zoomed into that class today, this morning. And the movie that we were talking about is A Quiet Place, uh, which I loved when it came out. It's actually the first movie I ever reviewed. Like that's the first, when we launched The Collision, like the first thing on our website was a review for the original A, a Quiet Place because I, I was, you know, I loved it so much. Um, and I hadn't seen it for a while though. So like, to prepare for this class, I popped it in with my wife and like, it's so good. Like this, yeah. this is like a, I mean, it sort of does a lot of the same things that Jaws does. So like obviously like I'm in the target audience, but like it's just, 
it's like a horror thriller monster movie done right. Like it, it's very much like it doesn't, you know, desensitize. It it's there's some shocking emotional death, but it gets very pro life. Like it's very um, affirms the value of like life, and it's it's a total dad movie. I like guess the whole movie is just set on like a family and like a dad protecting his kids. But yeah. as a dad, like, like I'm a sucker for dad movies. Oh, yeah. Like you know the sacrifices that you got to make, and like you know it's in some ways like it's, it starts pretty slow because it just deals with these characters and like the the relationships of them. But like then when like the aliens and stuff start happening, like man, this is good. Like it does so much like almost Spielbergian of like the way it sets up the scenes and like just builds that tension, you know, and the whole concept, if you're not familiar, is like aliens invade earth, they're blind, but they can hear really good. So like they're attracted to any sounds like to survive. You just can't make any sounds and you have to adapt your life. And like, and it's just like, you're holding your breath the whole movie. Like, yeah. like I watch it with my wife and like, after we were finished, we were both like whispering to each other and like without even realizing, like tiptoeing around the hammock, setting our glasses down. Like it, it's such an effective movie. Yeah. But have you seen? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Have you seen the first? Yeah, it's one of my favorites uh, in that in that genre for sure. Like it's it was a brilliant. I remember seeing it when it came out. Um, yeah, brilliant movie. Yeah, because like, because like I love these movies, but some of them can like. Again, sort of like we talked about, like reduce things to spectacle. I'm just like, yeah. hey, let's see how the alien, you know, what violent ways we can kill off these dumb characters you don't care about. And, you know, and, you know you're almost cheering for the alien or the monster. Yeah, yeah. You know, quick, kill, kill them all. Like, you know, I'm tired of these human characters. Like, let the aliens rule the earth. Where this is very much like, like you don't want anyone to go because like, you care about this family. And like you just, you know, you see them like kind of heroically struggling. But it's just like a, a normal family. Well, it just I think it, it emphasizes all the right things that you want to be emphasized in a monster alien, you know, apocalyptic movie. Because I think, yeah, too 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 many of those focus either on like the the monster or the the bigger issue, the broader scope of the devastation and all that kind of stuff. But a quiet place really just zeroes in on like one family. And like their fight for survival, and you're rooting for that family, not like the you know global devastation that's being. Yeah. And there's like I said, there's three movies out now, and there I think there's a TV show that's coming out too. All good. Um, none of them are as good as the first one. I think they yeah. they probably get like progressively not as good as they go on. But even like day one, uh, the kind of prequel that came out this year is still better than most of the movies like this that come out. Like, yeah. So if you haven't seen, even if you're not like a super horror person, uh, this is probably a I mean, it's still intense. Like it's still, yeah, yeah, it's still a lot. But like, it's probably more accessible because it's not just super gory. Like you really don't see anyone die on screen. Like it's, there's not a lot of blood, and it's you know there is some very wholesome stuff going on. It's not like overly dark. It is inspirational. So if you haven't seen it, uh, could you guys check out? Um, a quiet place because you will be glad uh, that you did. But we're also hope that you are glad that you checked out the Faith and Pop Culture podcast. Uh, this Indeed, week. we are. Uh, I feel like we got some stuff off our chest of things that yeah. uh, that have been kind of nagging at me. This uh, opinions I had. Um, hopefully, we did that in, in like a thoughtful way and weren't just like you know outraged <laughs> at the outrage and just sort of yeah. you know doing uh, doing the thing we said we hate adding fuel to the uh, to, to the fire. But I do think all the things we talked about are important for Christians to get into. So we're glad that you have joined us for those conversations, and we hope that you will join us next week, every Thursday, for more conversations on faith and pop culture. Mm-hmm.